in. So I am honoured to welcome to the Design Note Studio the designer of the Century Collection, Spectre Ops, Foundations of Rome, and many others, Emerson Matsucci. Emerson, welcome to the Design Note Studio. Oh, thank you for having me here. It's an honour. So in life, we rarely get the opportunity to blow our own trumpet. We're expected to be modest, but here with this first question, you can brag as much as you want about yourself. So that question is, when did you know you were good at what you do? Oh, that's a that's a really good question. Um, I'll, I'll be very honest. I'm not sure uh, at what point I had, there wasn't a point of revelation that, hey, I, I can do this. And in fact, I still I still carry a little bit of what's known as imposter syndrome. So uh, oftentimes, uh, you know, I do question whether I actually have the capacity to keep making games. And so, and because of that, I'm oh, there's always this tremendous amount of pressure and anxiety to keep performing, keep being creative, uh, keep exploring um, game design. So, so it's a really, it's a, it's a fantastic question. And it's one that I don't have a very, very clear answer to. And in fact, sometimes I do wonder if that is, if that is a skill that I have obtained or am, uh, or am I just being lucky in, in many respects. And so often people, it's, it's that classic phrase, never attribute to malice what you could attribute to ignorance or something along those lines. And I often find, so I, I write and I, I am riddled with imposter syndrome. And people often accuse people of being lazy, and I often think that it's not laziness, but a symptom of fear. I'd rather not do anything than do something and fail. And and so do you, when it comes to game design, do you still have the the tyranny of the empty page when you start a new project? You're, You're scared to death whether you can actually, you know, roll out the skills and do it one more time. Oh yes, uh, actually, there, those thoughts kind of creep in, but it's usually in the later stages of the the process of developing. So, uh, I guess one of the um, one of the qualities that I have is that I am not afraid to put something down on paper to try it, to bring it in front of my playtest uh, groups, or to just complete strangers to playtest an idea. Uh, but my general trepidations are usually in regards to whether this is something that is viable and you know am i creating something new am i just flooding the market with something that already exists that doesn't need to exist uh wasting paper you know adding more to greenhouse gases all those things you know i'm increasing my carbon footprint by creating you know tens of thousands of of something that didn't even need to exist so those thoughts always creep into my mind absolutely Uh and so what was the journey? You, you've been designing games now. The, the first time, the first game of yours that I became familiar with was Spectre Ops, and that, that's been around for quite a while, and you've been sort of in the industry now for quite a while. What was the journey that got you into designing games? Oh, okay. So this was an interesting, um, really interesting question. I actually, um, for a long time, I was a software developer, and my goal uh, for... For when I was uh, working in Wall Street, so I work in, I was working downtown Manhattan uh, as an IT professional and software developer. And uh, what's funny was my goal was that I would retire, uh, you know, climbing the corporate ladder and eventually retiring. And once I retired, then I was going to pursue uh, designing games. So, uh, but because of the environment that we were in, that uh, particular economic climate where um, so the type of work that I was doing for software was uh, being outsourced. So that was like a very new thing at that particular time. And so the because I was more of a, um, we call it TNM consultant. So it's time and material consultant. And so we would take on projects, but then at, at the conclusion of the project, then that my involvement with that company ended at that particular point. So, so it's more like I was kind of, think of it more like freelance. And uh, when we first, when my partner and I first started, doing this, that work was very plentiful at that time. Uh, but as outsourcing became more of a mainstream thing and that a lot of companies started to do more and more outsourcing, uh, and also the regions where work was being outsourced was also developing their infrastructure, then it, you know, it, I was very aware that uh, my line of work was quickly evaporating. So, uh, and there were gaps of time between my projects. And so I decided, you know, I'm going to try to utilize that time to do something that I enjoy because it it wasn't something that where it was set um 
the schedules weren't so predictable to where I could um, fill in those with other contract style work. So, so I decided, you know, if I have this unpredictable set of time, I'm going to spend it doing something I enjoy. So that's where I delved into, into game design. And I've always wanted to, to create games. Uh, funnily enough, though, I started as a publisher. I was thinking, you know, I'd like to be involved in the game industry in some form. But I didn't think that I would be designing games. I thought I would actually be publishing games. I came from the perspective as a publisher. And I designed uh, a set of games because in my mind, I had this perception that no self-respecting designer is going to go with a company that has no track record. So I designed games just to actually have something in the catalog. So, And so... When you look at sort of great sports people, great musicians, there's this there's this feeling that they were they were touched by God. You know, it's a sort of natural thing. They're born into it. And what we don't see with great sports people, with great musicians, we don't see the work that goes in behind the scenes. But when I see someone like, you know, Serena Williams, Lionel Messi, there's always a feeling that, you know, they must work hard, but there is something unquantifiable there mm-hmm. that, that changes them from being just average to brilliant. And, and is it the same with game design, do you think? Do you think game designers are born or made? Yeah, that's another fantastic question. And I do understand that whole perspective that there is some kind of a quality that is unquantifiable, the, um, uh, the je ne sais quoi uh, quality. Uh, but with game design, it's... Um, I still feel, even though I've been in this industry for, I guess it's been about a decade now, I still feel fairly nascent in this industry. And because there's so much of game design that I still don't quite understand. And that leads to that feeling of like, I'm kind of stumbling through it. And so for, from my perspective, it's, it may not be a matter of like having a particular talent, right? But it's, um, for game design, I've, and this is just my personal feelings on this, is that oftentimes my successes, I feel like for each of my successes, I felt like I stumbled into them rather than I had uh, created a path, a flow chart of some, some kind, you know, some kind of a checklist uh, to get there. So uh, because of that, I, I do think that game designers, it's, I think that it is a, it's a skill uh, that can be learned. So I don't think that game designers are necessarily like born with specific qualities. Uh, I could, I could absolutely be wrong here. Uh, so it's just my, my personal opinions on this. So, um, and that's from the perspective of someone who's doing game design, but I feel like I don't have a concrete grasp on the, the whole gamut of this discipline, if that makes sense. And so, who are the who are the game designers that you most admire? Because when you say game mm-hmm. designers are born, not made, and I see a lot of designs, and I, I feel that, and then mm-hmm. I play something by Rainer Knizia or mm-hmm. Vlada Chavatel, and I think, but this seems to transcend the normal way brains work, and it's you know something something magical. Do you have designers who you play and you go, wow, how did they do that? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. There are a lot of designers that I admire. Uh, I, I can list uh, heaps of them. Uh, I think you've already mentioned like Vlad Shvatel, Reiner Knitzer, Eric Lang, Ignacy Trevicek, you know, Bruno Cathala, Antoine Bell. I can, I can keep going and going and going uh, of the designers that I, I highly admire. Um, but um, from studying their design, so I've spent a lot of time, I probably spend as much time just studying uh, other works, other designs, to try to see if I can get some kind of grounded understanding of the the game design, um, and I try to see it more from the perspective that it is a it is a dis, it's a discipline, it's a science in, in a way. Um, I, I've had some interesting discussions with uh, publishers and other designers who um, who have that strong um, uh, that strong feeling that uh, game design, there's just as much art as there is to, uh, you know, design the mechanics of science behind it. Uh, but the more I've, um, the more I've done design uh, and the more I've explored it, the more I feel personally that there's a lot of, of science and discipline. Uh, and it can be, it can be viewed from an academic perspective to try to quantify like what makes good design 
good and and so forth so it's i at the time that um that i was going to college game design was not uh, was not a major that was um, available at that time but now there is so i think that there's it's more recognized that there is something that can be taught within within this discipline and so you know you you're working as a sort of semi-freelancer on wall street and then you, you know, work is sporadic, so you're designing games in between. How long did it take you to get your first game published? I mean, you self-published, you formed your own company, but how long did it take for other companies to come around and say, oh, this is good, we'd like to publish it? Oh, actually, yeah. I was very, very fortunate in that uh, it wasn't long after I had published my own designs that, uh, so I had self-published two games uh and then my third game was spec drops which was picked up uh prior to uh me actually publishing it so i had it actually on the docket to be the third release for my company but uh i had uh run into colby duck from planet games and we had partnered up and that was gonna that became my first published game so it was it was definitely not long after uh i had self-published my second game and how was the process different from self-publication to working with a with another publisher? Did you have to learn how to take criticism? Oh well, um, because uh, as you play test your games and to try to validate that there is uh, that there is something that's uh, that can be turned into a product. So uh, it's it's you know part and parcel for being a game designer. You need to be able to take uh, criticism in all, in all its forms. And so that part uh, was not, um, uh, there was nothing that was uh, outstandingly different in that regard. So uh, what was what was interesting was that uh, there was, with going with a the publisher, they have far more resources than say like a one man self-publishing shop. So they, they had hired, you know, phenomenally talented artists uh, they had rules writers. That's one area that I struggled with, um, and also the uh, the marketing as well. So there's like a lot of aspects of publishing that I was fairly ignorant of because you know, I came into it very new. So and it opened my eyes to all those different aspects. So that was definitely one of the bigger, uh, the biggest differences of working with a publisher versus self-publishing. So can you give us an overview of your process, how you come from a single idea to the finished game in a box? Oh, okay. So I usually start with, I have a a Google Word doc, uh, a Google Docs page where I would write any time that an idea pops into my head, I would write an entry in in there. I would date it. uh, I would put a little summary. And uh, usually it's because I come up, there's an idea that pops into my head at... uh, at a time when I don't have like the, I'm in the middle of something, so I don't have the time to kind of like mentally explore it. So I would always put a note in there. And then the second part of it is that then I go back, if the if that idea sounds still sounds exciting after a day or so, then I would start to explore it. And I would create another Google Doc, uh, and I would cut and paste that entry as like sort of like the introduction or like the synopsis. And then from there, I start to explore the the ideas, uh, then I would think about the mechanisms, and I would and I would um, usually my document would have several sections. One of which is just sort of what are the potential mechanisms, and each one also has like a little short section that says here are games that I should explore to make sure that I'm not you know reinventing the wheel. So I would do some research, little you know market research if you will, uh, to see what other games are kind of similar either in theme, in mechanics, in experience, and so forth. And if it still passes those particular tests, then I still I continue to a uh, point where I draft up what would the prototype look like, uh, and then on to like the next significant milestone step in the in the process would be to actually create the prototype itself, a sort of like a proof of concept uh, or an MVP. And then uh, once I have that, uh, then I bring it to uh, my playtest groups and we play just to see if the concept has any merit. And then move forward from there. If it does, then I start to refine and do iterations, uh, play, t- play test it multiple times. And then uh, then usually we try to figure out whether if it's if it's mechanics first design to uh, what kind of themes would be there. So we uh, there are occasions where I would get like a focus group. Um, it's, it's the same play test group. 
uh, but just like the format of discussion is a little different where I say, okay, now that you've played this, what are some conceivable themes that would work around this? Or sometimes it's the other way around where if it's a, a, a theme and we, we play test uh, the prototype, sometimes I would ask, okay, what mechanisms would, might work better to represent this thematic element that I'm trying to express in this design? And so forth. So we'd have some of those discussions. But eventually, it'll get to the point where the game uh, feels uh, uh, at that 80% mark. When it's, it's, so it, this is like what we call like the pre-polish phase mm. of the game. And then, and then there, from there, we yeah, I make that determination whether I'm going to pitch this to a publisher, which publisher would I pitch it to, um, and, or you know potentially, you know, is it something that I want to self-publish, uh, so forth, bring it up on Kickstarter. Those type of things. So that would be sort of like the last consideration in the process. And so I think it was Charlie Chaplin who said it, but I'm sure it's been attributed to a thousand different people. But the statement that creativity is 10% inspiration, 90% perspiration. How true is that as a concept, do you think? Oh, uh, well, <laughs> uh, the the concept itself, I think, is, is fairly true and fairly applicable in, in game design. Uh, oftentimes those numbers will vary quite a bit. So... Uh, but yeah, there's because once you have that initial concept, there is quite a bit of work uh, to be done in order to manifest that into something that could be a product. And so, how has your process developed over time? I, I find with myself, when I first sat down to start to write, mm -hmm. maybe the product that comes out of the other end isn't wildly different, but the way I get from A to Z is much more efficient, much quicker. I have a much better grasp of how to do what I want. I mean, has your process developed over time and has it become more efficient? Uh, I would say that it has in that uh, the way I started, I didn't know what was the proper way to start a design. Um, it's not vastly different than what I do now, but what I do notice is that it's, I've uh, introduced a lot of uniformity in the way that I approach uh, the, the process. And what I mean by that is that when I first started, I would write notes, say, in a notebook, or I would put it in a Word document. Um, I would put, you know, get some graph paper, start drawing things. And so the, the medium by which I would um, try to jot down all of these ideas were kind of scattered all about. And so uh, with each project, I decided, okay, well, I'm going to try to find some way. And this could be sort of like my software uh, background sort of kicking in where I try to come up with like a process that I can apply to all of the design projects that I work on. So I try to, so I've gotten into particular habits where like I, like I had mentioned, you know, the initial idea I put into this document, then once uh, I decide to explore that idea, then I put it into this document. So I, I now have more of a defined process. Uh, it's not vastly different than what I do before, but it's just done in a more organized fashion to where uh, I can go back and I could cross-reference uh, the different assets that I had working on a particular project. That's really the biggest difference. So it seems to me that you're you're not just a designer, but a a student of the art of design. So so what would you say is the crux of a good game design? Mm, okay, so. That's that is the uh, I guess you could say that is the MacGuffin uh, as in game designers we're always we're striving to have an answer to that. So so the game design really is uh, all about um, trying to understand how mechanisms and componentry, uh, aesthetics, theming, narrative, how that translates to an enjoyable experience for the end user. So we're trying to make those particular correlations. Uh, you know, I myself, I have like a sort of a mental library of like the different uh, mechanisms or different tools that we have at our disposal and how that reflects to what the player's experience is. Um, you know, it's not, I, I make it sound way more scientific than it actually is. It's um, it's just more through, through that experience that we develop those, um, we develop those what we think are connections between between what the game presents and what the users feel. And so we're trying to develop that library and try to develop that understanding of that relationship between those experiences to try to um, 
like, you know, try to find what defines a good design versus bad design. Uh, and I know at a surface level, it's, you know, it's been, um, it's been documented. Uh, there are, uh, you know, in the academic field of study, there are books that sort of help define what are some of those areas. And so what, you know, I, I think modern game designers now, we try to delve deeper and deeper into those subjects and try to define more of those relationships and try to find more of the, the deeper connections between these things. So I hope that answers the question. <laughs> so I've seen over the sort of 10 to 12 years I've been sort of seriously into gaming, mm -hmm. a development in which games are becoming more complex. If you look at the sort of first wave of Euro games in the sort of mid to late 90s, mm -hmm. there, was, there was a focus on very simple rules but very deep gameplay. Mm -hmm. And as time has gone on, it seems to me that especially Euro games are becoming more complex, more unwieldy, let, yet your games seem to have a sort of crystalline simplicity to them. Do you think that that style of game design, the, the, the simple rules with the deep gameplay, gives you less of a place to hide when it comes to people's reaction? Do you, do you feel like you can't hide under 27 different tracks all of the pieces have got to be good. Uh, I mean, I, pers I personally feel that way because my tastes in games uh, lean in that, in that particular direction. Um, but I think I, I usually try to simplify it to simple mechanics just because, well, my brain's not really good at processing a whole bunch of complicated things uh, at once. And that's one of the reasons I was a software developer was that, well, I let the computer do all the heavy lifting for me. So... Uh, but when it comes to the, with game design, I think there are, there's, uh, for, uh, a market out there, there is a pleasure to being able to take a complex system of interconnected mechanics and internalizing that, that process in and of itself seems to be something that there are players out there that really, really enjoy that. And that's why we do see, uh, games becoming more and more complex because that there is a certain amount of enjoyment. In just the, it, it's almost like the the players have a feeling of accomplishment when they're able to con, you know, to conquer this behemoth of a rule set. And so, and so I try to be as open minded with different uh, designs, philosophies, levels of complexity, and so forth, to try to understand like all the different avenues at which people can find enjoyment in in a game. So. And I do apologize. I tend to I tend to like go and veer off from your original question. Uh, I always try to circle back if I can. So, but if I veer too far, please feel free to stop me and reel me back in. No problem at all. So, once you've signed the contract with a publisher, is that then your job done, or do you have a big input into the development process? And when it comes to art and graphic design and all of that sort of stuff, do you have an input in those areas too? Oh, this is an absolutely fantastic question, and it is one that actually varies quite a bit based on the, the publisher. So the publishers I work with tend to like to work with their designers, uh, not just at the point that they finalize the design, you've signed the contract, uh, but I, I tend to like to work with publishers that uh, have their designers involved with other parts of the process, too. Um, yeah, I really appreciate when publishers do value the, the designers like sort of original vision. So when we come up with a design, we have a theme attached to it. We have like a particular experience in our mind. So we have a strong vision. And uh, I go so far as to like when I visualize a product, I also like visualize the, the box that it comes in. What type of art? What should that art evoke? And when they open the box, what is the first thing that they see? You know, uh, how do the components feel? So I, I take into those things into account. And I love to be able to share that with the publisher. And the publisher I've worked with um, uh, have all been incredibly great to work with in this regard, where I do have input. So sometimes I would receive proofs of the graphic design and the initial illustrations, and they allow me to you know, provide some input uh, on on those aspects of it, uh, you know, sometimes when it comes to like materials and things like that, uh, it's because I think it is a good idea for publishers to tap into their designers because sometimes the designers, because they've spent a lot more time on this design and sort of like visualizing how this is going to become a product, 
that it's and we've spent a lot of time doing this that it's worthwhile to like tap the designer to see if there are things that there are some considerations that the designers have thought about that the publisher is just now you know taking into consideration so and you know you're a grizzled veteran of the board game industry now you've had loads of games published but do you how does it feel when your designer copies arrive and you open the cardboard box and you you pull out the game for the first time and it's there in shrink with the art and your name across the top of the box do you still get that frisson when you open when you open that box for the first time i have to say ben you have some of like the best best questions uh i've never been asked this which is which is great um i think i i've seen other designers have like their unboxing of like their first copy and I, I get that, um, oh gosh, what was, it, what was the term for it? Uh, um, where you, you can kind of sympathize and uh, put yourself, oh, you live vicariously. That's the word that yeah. I was looking for. So you get that vicarious experience. Uh, but for, for me personally, um, it's a, I'm almost the exact opposite. So when I've gotten my first uh, copies, I, you know, I, I unceremoniously just open it up, open it to make sure all the components, make sure all the rules are there, make sure that all my play testers are accredited in, in the rule books and go through the components, make sure the components look right. There's the right number of components. And then I would toss everything back in the box and, and put it away. So I, I don't, when it, when it comes to that, that whole process of getting that first copy, I'm quite, I don't stand on ceremony there. <laughs> so uh, I, I'm, I'm fairly certain that I'm probably a minority in that regard. So let's talk about the future now. So, so what do you have coming out in the future that we can all play? Okay, well, the ones that were announced recently, we have, uh, I think the most recent one was Metal Gear Solid. Uh, very excited about that. But just prior to that was uh, the Halloween game. So based on the 1978 uh, Halloween, the slasher classic. <laughs> and then just prior to that, you know, just a few months before, uh, the Persona 5 Royal uh, game was announced as well. So those are the ones that, you know, that will be coming out in the, hopefully in the near future, uh, within uh, either by the end of this year or uh, towards the middle of next year. Those should be those should be releasing. And so, if you work on a project, and do you do you ever know it's going to be successful, or is there always an element of rolling the dice when you it publish is. a game? <laughs> That's a great question. It's always rolling the dice, or at least from my perspective. Um, and I have, uh, what's interesting is I've, I've uh, with, the, uh, with the help of uh, someone who I respect greatly, his name is Nick Bentley, he runs Underdog Games, and formerly he used to work for uh, North Star Games, and he introduced me to the process of uh, pre-mortems. So you kind of like imagine, okay, so when this game gets released, what, why would it fail, right? So you're creating a summary and you're kind of in, imagining a scenario as to what would be the causes of something to fail. And so so I it, it became a sort of like a valuable process, a valuable exercise in, in understanding where you feel like the product is weak, where are its weak points and so forth. Yeah, but every time uh, a product gets released, uh, my first th- thought is that it's going to fail. These are probably the reasons why I should probably look into what i can learn from this and this is before the game is actually released i would actually go through this um thought experiment or thought exercise and and from there try to see how much i can learn and also then once the product is out then to uh assess how close my pre-mortem was to what how the game released and, and when I first got into games and I first got speaking to people involved with games, mm-hmm. everyone always said to me, there's no money in games. You, you can't make money if you're a game designer. Mm-hmm. But I've seen with Kickstarter and the sort of shooting popularity of tabletop games, do mm-hmm. you think that old idea is rapidly becoming a myth now? Uh, actually, it, there is truth to it, but I think the, the truth is actually mistold in it. Uh, it is more of a function of the, there is money to be made absolutely because there is an industry around it. So that's, that's something that can't be denied. But I think the adage, the truth in the adage is that with the number of designers that are out there, the number of products that are out there, right, 
the viability of being able to make a, a livelihood from this is uh, is strikingly low when you compare it to other industries. So the amount of effort and the amount of risk you need to take in order to, to try to achieve some level of financial success, it, those odds and those risks that you're taking are an abysmal prospect when you compare it to other industries. And I think that's where the, you know, when people say that there's no money in, in, um, in games, I think that they're referring to uh, the, the big picture uh, but that doesn't mean that eat an invent, an individual can't find success in this industry. So I've got two more questions for you then. So sure. firstly, uh, you go to a convention, you go out for a meal in the evening and you're coming back from the loo and you hear a, a table of gamers talking and you hear your name mentioned. So you sidle into the corner and you eavesdrop on their conversation. Mm -hmm. What do you hope they're saying about you? Uh, I hope they say that I'm not, I'm not bad. <laughs> <laughs> I have. I don't have very high uh, high expectations. I just. I just hope that they enjoy the games that I create. So. And so my last question then: Why is gaming good? Hmm. This is this is a great. Also another great question. You you you. Um, when it comes to uh, interview questions, I find that you have some of the more interesting ones uh, of the interviews that I have done. And why gaming is good? It is. Uh, it is a great outlet for people to socialize. And I think that's very important. So it allows people to connect. Uh, that's not to say that they're, that it's better or worse than other things. So as an example, some people will get together uh, at, a, at uh, a gathering hall just to speak a language, right? Because they feel comfort or they want to practice a language. Uh, you have people that can connect because they like certain particular sports. And so forth. So gaming provides just another outlet for us to be able to uh, socialize, to be able to connect, to make friendships, to create memories, and so forth. So, and that's why I think you know gaming is a great hobby. It's incredibly approachable. So, unlike other things where you need to have like a certain level of competence in a language, or you need to be athletic uh, to be able to participate in certain activities, uh, gaming is an incredibly approachable and incredibly in inclusive hobby uh, i think that's why it is is one of you know one of my favorite hobbies for sure excellent so if people want to get hold of you if people want to see what's coming next from you and all of that good stuff how mm -hmm. would they go about doing that oh well usually it's uh, the the publishers will do a lot of the the marketing and pu you know, publicization of my releases uh, but if people want to uh, I'm. I have to admit, I am terrible at social media, uh, but I do have a, a Twitter account, so it's at Nazca Games, uh, and that's probably the one place where I do have sort of like a semi outlet for informing people of what are things that are going to be coming up. Excellent. Well, Emerson Matsuchi, thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Ben. This is fantastic.